Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel and thank you so much for joining me today. So today I'm going to be sharing five strategies to provide learners with equitable access to mathematics learning. This is a little snippet uh, from a talk that I gave for Mac Make Math Moments. If you're interested in trying to create more equity and access to mathematics learning for your students, then please keep on watching. Okay, so today I'm going to be looking at the top five strategies to provide learners with equitable access to mathematics learning, and I'm just going to make myself a little bit smaller. So here is a summary of what I'm going to be discussing in terms of the strategies, and I'm going to go through each one and talk a little bit in detail. So the first one is about creating a positive learning environment. I think students need to feel like they are safe and secure when learning mathematics. The second one is about helping our students to embrace productive struggle. The third one is about setting really high expectations for every single learner that you have in the classroom. The fourth one is about fostering a collaborative learning environment. And the last strategy is to allow access to the curriculum for all learners. So I'm just going to talk very briefly about each of these strategies. So in terms of creating a positive learning environment, a large body of research accumulated over the last two decades showed that a high quality teacher-student relationship is one of the most important and effective ways to promote social and academic development in terms of learning and achievement. And I cannot stress the importance of really fostering a strong, positive rapport with your students, earning trust, building respect, mutual respect and mutual trust so that your students trust you and know that you have their best interest at heart when it comes to mathematics learning. Now, the second strategy is about productive struggle. And we know that learning only happens when students go through some kind of productive struggle. In fact, productive struggle leads to better learning. And the reason is due to neuroscience, a white substance in students' brains called myelin. Challenging tasks actually spur the production of myelin, a substance that increases the strength of brain signals. And this is when we try to help our learners develop their identity in terms of who they are as a math learner, to try and develop those self-regulation skills, the resilience to be able to problem solve and navigate through ambiguity and not knowing what the answer is and to develop those very important problem solving skills as well. So I want to just also briefly mention how we help our students to develop their identities as, as mathematics learners. And this is retrieved from Anderson's work where he talks about different dimensions that actually contribute to the identity of a mathematics learner. He talks about engagement, use mathematical tasks that allow students to develop strategies for solving problems and meanings, for mathematical tools, organize the classroom, uh, et cetera. Um, please feel free to pause the video at this stage and have a read of these three different dimensions. There's a fourth dimension actually called nature, but nature is um, the dimension that uh, you can't change. It's either what you're born with or the circumstances that you cannot change. However, engagement, imagination, and alignment, they are the dimensions that we can develop and support students. To develop. Okay, so the next part, I need to just move myself out of the way again. So the next part is really setting high expectations for every learner. And that's that idea of fostering a growth mindset, because, you know, we want students to believe that with dedication and effort, they are able to understand mathematics, everybody can do math, and everyone arrives at the same conceptual understanding. So I have an example on the slide here, which is due with the Pythagorean theorem. Students understand that the areas produced from the shorter sides of a right angle triangle equates to the area produced from the hypotenuse. That is an understanding that all students can arrive at. They can explore the areas. It could be a triangle, square, or some kind of polygon that are produced in the shorter sides of the right angle triangle and then they can actually look at the relationship between the area produced from the hypotenuse. Every single student can arrive at that understanding, but maybe they will be exploring that kind of problem using different calculations, different steps, there'll be different prompts, and there'll be different scaffolding as well. Okay, so the fourth strategy is to 
uh, promote a collaborative learning environment. And we know the power of collaboration amongst colleagues, amongst your fellow teachers, and also amongst students. So I think that there are benefits to whole class, small group, as well as individual work. So it's important that we still give students time and space to think individually on their own. It gives thinking time. It improves confidence in a very low risk situation and it develops self-management skills. And we actually use individual work when we want our students to set goals and targets or if they're answering some kind of metacognition prompt, evaluating their progress and achievement, or even when they're initially presented with a problem, I think it's important that everybody has the quiet first few minutes to look at a problem, to synthesize it, digest it, before then you actually go into a deep discussion about it. Now, when should we do group work? Because group work is uh, very important as well. It gives accountability. You get to listen to other perspectives. Uh, students can think of problems in different ways. You can delegate tasks within a problem. It promotes that idea of collaborative intelligence that the sum is greater than the uh, individual parts added together. Groups stimulate creativity. And it's a much needed and valued skill in society to be collaborative and it fosters learning and comprehension. But I think it's important that we have the right conditions that will produce successful collaborative learning. So here are some questions that I've got to help guide us on when to use collaborative learning. Can the problem be interpreted in many different ways? Is information from different sources required? Is the problem an open-ended problem where there are likely to be many possible solutions? Is it a complex problem with many different aspects to explore? And does the learning experience allow for different roles or multiple inputs? So we have to be really intentional when it comes to using collaborative learning in our classrooms. Okay, the fifth strategy, the last one, is about allowing access to the curriculum for all learners. How do we allow all learners of different backgrounds and readiness access the mathematics curriculum? This is in the form of high ceiling, low threshold tasks, or open-ended tasks. So we have to be very intentional in our learning experience design that everybody can have access to the problem or the scenario that you have. And if they don't have access, then we can provide a lot of prompts and scaffolding to help move different learners along their learning journey so that they feel success. There's a very fine line between frustration and challenge. We want our students to be challenged, but we don't want them to walk away from our lesson completely frustrated. So there are my top five strategies to provide learners with equitable access to mathematics learning. If you have any comments at all or any suggestions on how we can encourage uh, our students to embrace the productive struggle or how you foster a positive learning environment, please feel free to put it in the comment section below. Thank you for joining me again this week and I hope to see you next time. Bye!